the um, first thing that I like to do is just get your name on videotape, first and last name. James, by middle name? Uh, first and I last. James Iwao Matsudaira. Thank you. Now, you grew up... Um, on, you grew up in Seattle or Bainbridge? Yes, Seattle. In Seattle. Oh, you're one of those Seattle people. Yeah. Oh. How can you blow yourself to marry a Seattle person? I dragged him over and made him a Bainbridge person. <laughs> <laughs> what, what, uh, was your, your parent, what did your dad do? My dad was a camera, can, uh, salmon cannery foreman before the war. In, in, in Seattle or? Uh, they went up to Alaska, Kitchikan. So where did you go? Back and forth, do the season. The season, the... yeah. Then the, the other times, I think he sh shucked oysters. That's a that's for a friend of his. Tough, uh, yeah. a good oyster shucker. Yeah, he was. Lot. He was good. Yeah. Uh -huh. Wait, so was he um, Nisei? No, he was Nisei. He was Nisei. Yeah. So did he come to Washington to start, or he came as uh, uh, to represent his father's company, settling the nor. Um, not Noritake, um, pottery for the Alaskan ex Exposition. Oh, really? Yeah. Oh, wow. Huh. And then just decided to stay? or and, and he never did go back, except for one time. But he decided to stay, and he started playing semi-pro baseball. Against really? the, like, like with the Seattle Rainiers and things. Did you, at that time, did they rotate positions, or, or did they have position players? I think they, they had position players, I think. Yeah. Uh, well, that's but he never did talk about it too much. We have pictures of him. but. Uh, oh, is that right? Yeah. But, so I guess, <clears throat> was it as unique, because uh, um, they'd had the, the, the race barrier before in baseball, was that, do you know if that was, were there other Japanese players with him, or? Yeah, there were, it was an all-Japanese team oh, that he all played Japanese? for, yeah. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yeah. What, what, but he was a pitcher. Pitcher? Yeah. Did they, do you know the name of the team? Uh, I don't recall what it is now. Tough questions yeah. here. Yeah. Huh. What about your mom? My mother was a home, what do you call it? Home, um, homemaker? Homemaker, yeah. And how many? Uh, she had 14 children altogether. So, and then uh, when, when we left for camp, I think there were... Ten of us, and she had one in Camp Harmony, then two or one in Minidoka, uh, Minidoka then two others while we, after we came home. Wow! So. Your dad not needed to be in farming with that many children. <laughs> <laughs> Fourteen kids total. Fourteen kids total. Yeah. So mm -hmm. when, um, how old were you when you went to camp? See, I was just in the fifth grade, so that was ten. Yeah, 10 years old, I guess. Did, did, were you old enough to remember Pearl Harbor? I mean, was it to conceive what was going on, or was that? I don't recall reacting to it at all. Um, I guess it was just not part of my world at that, that time. Yeah, I mean, that's, you know, kids, you know. Yeah. But we were in, at, um, okay, we lived right across the street from Providence Hospital, up on that area, 17th, 16th and James. Jefferson, and uh, I don't I don't remember reacting, you know, because I didn't listen to the radio, I guess, at that time. So I wouldn't really, it was the next day or something that when my dad brought it up or something. Yeah. So do you remember your dad bringing it up? Though? I mean, yeah, he was kind of sad, saying that was kind of a dumb thing to do type, you know. So that was, it was his feeling? Yes. Yeah. Huh. Did, did, um, when you left for camp, um, well, so that's, you know, again, history books, things get misconstrued. People think, oh, well, Pearl Harbor happened, then everybody went to camp the next day. There was oh, a period oh, of time. Yeah, I remember having to go down, I think it was 19th and Madison in that area to register with my dad as a family. And we were assigned family number 12099 was our family number. And then dash one indicated the father, and dash two indicated the mother, and then any of the siblings were in order, a dash number. So I think I was dash seven or something like that. So when you went to register, was it, uh, 
Did you just go to an office to register, or? It was on the street. I remember. I I recall. It was. I thought it was down on this, in the right, right there in the sidewalk. But each family had to register, and in Seattle had you know four zones, I guess, for for uh, evacuation. The first zone being in that Japanese town area, and then the the, the zone four was the outline areas that like where we were. So. So you were zone four. Yeah, we were zone four. And did that mean is that we, zone one would leave at a certain time and zone yeah, four would? Yeah. Leave? So I think we were about the last ones to be evacuated. And that's why we ended up in the fairgrounds at proper Camp D in Harmony. The others were ended up in the, previously ended up in the parking lots. So you yeah. ended up in what is now today? Yeah, the Puyallup fairgrounds. And then we were assigned barracks or rooms and underneath the grandstand. And my father complained about that. So we were moved over to where the octopus ride is located, right there in that area, what right near the right near the Dipper and the Fun House and the and the Mystery House. Again, that kind of creates some of the irony of what happened back then and what's there now to think of. Well, I remember going into the sneaking into the Fun Houses and and playing around in the slides and the real big, huge, real barrel that they had. And the campus, camp police would come after us, and they would leave me alone because I was too small. <laughs> They'd go after my brother, though. So it was... It was fun time for us, you know. And it really was the fairgrounds. Sure, yeah. I mean, it was yeah, it was the fairgrounds, yeah. So, like, we had the one of the display halls today was our main cafeteria. And there was a building next to it that, that was a children's cafeteria. Um, each of the... Areas within the, the Camp D were assigned lunch and dinner hours that they had to go to, and they bring this bell to start the, the lunch sessions or the meal sessions. And then we had we were separated because of, we were children. We were separated into the, the ch children's mess hall. So the family didn't get to eat together. Not not at that time. No. no. That's but that was true of Camp, Camp uh, Minidoka also. Oh, really? Yeah. Um, kids tended to eat with the, their friends sometimes, you know. Because I heard that that was, I talked to some people, and that was what was hard on the parents. Yeah, it was, yeah. Because now you're starting to break the family apart, whether planned or unplanned. Yeah. I don't know which. But. Well, I know my mother was mentioning sometimes that she felt so sad that when she'd go into, into the meal line, They'd slosh the food down, you know, and she brought tears to her eyes, uh, being treated that way as prisoners like. And to this day, I won't eat mutton. Is that is that? Oh, we had a lot of. I think we had a lot of mutton. For I've heard of a, a couple <clears throat> uh, mutton, uh, and there was hard pancakes. <laughs> oh, is that right? Yeah. So you remember the meals? Yeah, I remember the meals. Yeah. So, now but, your dad didn't, uh, when you went, your dad and your mom and all the children went together? Yes, yeah, we so, were not separated like Heath's dad was. I was going to say, you were, you were at least a fortunate, being a relative term, but I know that some of the farmers out here, the FBI right. came and yeah. you had a gun or blasting. Well, there gun. were people in Seattle that that, that happened to also, but, but they were more the, the leaders of the community and things. Which is, I mean, it's funny when you hear leaders of the community. That mean today, if they came in, it'd be like, "Oh, you're the you're the head of the Rotary," which is yeah, yeah, you know, or or, well, or a community. I think the impact was that since the leaders were all interned, it left the second generation to make the decisions, the JACL, you know, and some of those decisions that they made, not having not not having the experience, may have caused some confusion. Whatever. Huh. I, I hadn't heard that before. Well, I just can't imagine your mom with, and dad with 10 kids. Um, bus? Did they bus you down? Yeah, they bused us down from right Kitty Corner from Providence Hospital, 17th and Jefferson. 
And I don't remember seeing soldiers there with bayonets, but we did board buses and were bused to Puyallup Fairgrounds. What school had you been going to? At Marino, which was right across the street from Providence Hospital there, run by the Marino fathers and sisters. So was that a pretty uh, international school or? Well, it was primarily built to house or to um, babysit type day nursery and kindergarten, but it gradually grew up to be K, uh, day, day nursery through eighth grade. And it was a private Catholic school. But was there um, Caucasian and Japanese American? And mostly, mostly Japanese at that time, because oh, it was a Japanese parish. You know? and, and during the war, the Filipinos came more and more. Filipinos came and became mixed. And um, we used to have, after the war, we used to have a Japanese mass and a Filipino mass. Were the, um, the priests and, and brothers, were they um, Caucasian? Or? Caucasian, yeah. Do, do, do you remember, did you have a connection with any of the teachers saying goodbye or anything? Or, or? No, I don't remember. No. I, I only remember on the bus, one of my friends had come up and waved goodbye to us. He's the only guy that I remember. His name was Billy. Um, wow. But the others stayed home, I guess. Yeah. I would guess, and again, I'm making the big assumptions, but with some of the kids, their parents probably, the kids probably would have done it on their own, because kids are kids, and you know, nobody, but parents probably also. Yeah, well, I don't remember seeing that at all with, even with the rest of the family. Was it hard on your mom and dad? I think it was, yes. They really didn't talk about it. But it, is, it took its toll on my dad, I, I know, discipline-wise and things. You know. well, uh, yeah, because now, <clears> as a household, <throat> now you're put into this conglomeration management, family management, and discipline. That's the first time I've seen so many Japanese at one time. <laughs> That's where I've heard a couple people say that, which yeah. was an interesting yeah. experience yeah. In, in one way, I mean, but, but yeah, and then I, I assume, or do you know, did you, do you feel that your parents tried to kind of protect you and shield you from really what was? Yeah, I think it did. Uh, what, what did now, how long did you stay at, at uh, Camp Harmony? I think from May through September, or August in that time, and then then we were shipped to Minidoka. Did you, while you were at Camp Harmony, what? I mean, did you just have free time all the time, or did they school or organize you? Well, it was during the summertime, so we didn't have school at that time. But they had. I know. Remember, they had baseball games going. Then underneath the grandstand, they had a sumo rink, and I used to go play sumo all the time, and uh, as small as I was. I used to come back with a lot of candy and gums because I would uh, not force the guys out of the rink, but I would grab their legs and down them that way. So, so they did, uh, which, which, since there was this big fear going on of, oh, Japanese, but yet here was some more traditional Japanese mm -hmm. activities mm -hmm. being allowed. So, yeah, they had their, I think they must have had clubs and things, um, especially in Minidoka, but I don't. We didn't stay in Camp Harmony that long, so uh, I do remember the campus police, though. You know. Were they like guards or? Well, they they had I think they had uniforms too, but uh, yeah, they were the internal guardians, and uh, those are the ones that used to chase us out of the mystery house and the fun houses. So were they were they scary to you, or were they kind of more like? Well, the the chief was uh, he was a big guy, you know, Haribo, and uh, uh, yeah, he was he was daunting. Do, do you remember? Did they have was it like a a true prison? I mean, lights out at a certain time and not at that time. I don't remember. I remember the watching the P thirty eight dogfight all the time, right over our our area. That was really. Fun to watch. So that was at, at Puyallup? Puyallup. Really? Yeah. yeah. So training from? I think it, might, it must have been McCord, huh? Yeah. Huh. Wow. So as a kid, that... But they used to dogfight all the time over there, right above us. And yeah, we used to just watch that. But other than that, I don't remember 
any formal activities. Um, we were too young to participate in the baseball because the, the younger, I mean, the older generation were doing that. But they'd play right there, right between the, the main dining hall and the, the main bathrooms. At least we had flushing toilets, <laughs> whereas the rest of the camps, I think, had semi-flushing. You know, It was more like an outhouse type. So do you remember leaving Camp Harmony? And going to Mendoza? Yeah, I remember that because my mother wasn't with us. Uh, she was expecting her ninth or tenth baby at the time. And so she had to stay back. And uh, we were loaded on trains and the shades were pulled. And, and, but I don't, it wasn't Pullman type, it was just regular coach types. And we had to uh, sit most of the time. And then uh, my mother had to stay back, and they induced her um, child by uh, giving her castor oil and some other mixtures and, and then uh, making her walk, take cold and hot and cold showers, you know. The, the day after she gave birth, though, they loaded her onto the train in a stretcher, and uh, she came and joined us in Idaho after that. So that so must have been a week before she came and joined us. Wow. So she had to travel all by herself with the newborn. Yeah. Well, I remember one thing about Camp Harmony it was uh, the straw mattresses. Uh, and then uh, having to change it once a week, I think it was, the straw. But those that wet the beds were at the mercy of whoever. They couldn't change their mattresses and things. Oh boy, the smell of, yeah. I mean, it's bad yeah. you do summer yeah. camps and beds have been wet, but now add straw to yeah. the... Uh... Then uh, I remember the construction of the, of the barracks were such that the, the, the sloping ceiling, there was a gap between our next door neighbors, you know, a triangular gap on between the, the top of the wall and the top of the, the roof there. So you can hear everything your next door neighbor was saying. Or sometimes we knock the, the knot holes out of the pine boards so we can peek in. <laughs> I remember that, yeah. Who, do, you, do you remember who your neighbors were? What? I remember their faces. I can't remember their names now. So it wasn't somebody that you knew no. ended up no. next to you? Because no. we were, in our neighborhood, I think we were one of two. And the other family was uh, uh, married to a Filipino. So. They came to camp, but they left very early. They didn't stay the whole time we were there. What was Minidoka like? It was arid, dusty. Everything looked the same. Um, I don't know. I think I think the older people felt it was just terrible conditions. We moved into block six initially. Um, there were no uh, plumbing. And uh, we had to go to outhouses that were around the perimeter. And then sometimes the, the women would get, that were near the men's head, would write W-O in, in front. And so we'd have fights. <laughs> Because their their latrine would be on the other side of the uh, block then, Cecil. Uh, I remember doing that. Because <laughs> I assume as a child at night, if you had to go to the bathroom, you had to get up. And... Well, they had potties, you know, oh, porta did. potties. So every morning you watch all these women with their porta potties <laughs> going to the bathroom to dump their <laughs> stuff. So as a child, you didn't have to face that scary dark run. To... No, I. You get up in the morning, you see rattlesnakes, you know. Uh, trails and scorpion little tracks and things. And they, you know they were underneath the, the cross space there. Wow. That, that seems like that'd be scary as <clears throat> a child. And we used to go over to um, block five, I think it was, and take baths there in the, in the laundry tubs before our plumbing were connected and chase the women out and we'd take baths there. Or we'd go down to block two and take Japanese baths there. But 
I know one time we came out and we couldn't, couldn't find our, our home because everything looked the same. We were just wandering around there at nighttime. My dad finally had to come and look for us. Now, most of the people I've talked to have had families of four or five. And yeah, we had to have two, house, two rooms. No, and we, I... we took the, the partition between the two rooms and made a doorway. And so we were interconnected. Connected. Kids on one side, parents on the other, or boys and girls? Well, there was, I think it was, initially we had a five and a five person and a four per person room. And after my brothers left, we, we had a three and a six, I think. So. Where did um, your brothers go? Well, one went into the service, and one went back east to Michigan, Detroit, right, when he was 18, I think. So did your brother go into 442nd? Yes. He was wounded in Anzio, I think it was. Do you remember that? Him yes. Leaving yeah. And yeah, I what, remember that. I what? remember him leaving. I remember him coming back home for a visit, and and getting uh, sick because he was shot in the, in the wounded in the abdomen, and it was infecting on him. And so he had to make an emergency trip to Salt Lake City, I think it was, by ambulance. And he told the doctors what to do, but they weren't. They were too scared to do it. And he, all they had to do was puncture the the incision area or whatever and let it drain. But, and he was in uh, Illinois, recovering there. So he came back for about a week, I think it was, to visit while during the war. Well, we were still in camp. And so how old were you roughly at this time when he came back? I uh, must have been a sixth grader, so 11, 12. So did he come back in uniform? Yes. Yeah. Well, and he would not salute the officers because he was so, well, I shouldn't say this. No. <laughs> but he was so peeved at some of the officers that, that they had, you know, most of them were Caucasians, that they would bark out the orders and then run back to the back so they didn't have to face the firing thing. So, so he when, was, he was, when he was overseas, he wouldn't? No, no, when he came back home. Oh, when he came when back When he came home. for a visit, you know, to, uh, to Idaho. Yeah, you know, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't salute the officers at the station and things. That had to be, because again, it was um, that kind of hit me hard. It, you know why, why, uh, why act that way? But I understand what his feelings. So even as a five-year-old or a six-year-old, you could see and question what, why he did what he did. Yes, at that time, I I knew why he did it later on. You know. What do you, do you remember what your parents thought about him? Getting into the service? I don't. I don't think my dad really wanted him to go, but then he said, "Well, you know, there are others going too, so why not?" I, I think that. In fact, in our block, there was a blind man that also volunteered, and uh, he volunteered to be a clerk, but they rejected him. I'm always <laughs> amazed at. Uh, I don't think I would have been so humble. I mean, having been... Oh, I think, I think that's part of Japanese culture. You know. yeah. Don't complain. Make the best of it. What, now, your mom had uh, another child in camp. She had one in Canada Parmody, and then one, a boy in Minnesota. Then two others were born after we came back to Seattle. That, that answers the question that uh, uh, there are certain aspects of normal life that continue on in camp. <laughs> yep. Uh, so you were there how long at Minidoka? I think we were there from September through March or April, because we were the third family back to Seattle from Minidoka. And then the WRA tried to set up my dad in dad's employment as an example for the rest of the camp's personnel to see that there were jobs available in the Seattle area. But he kind of fooled them, and he was very picky about the kinds of jobs, and it kind of frustrated the, the authorities. And then the, uh, the history, the, the uh, 
classified histories from Washington, D.C. I had a copy of it. I think my, my son has it now. But um, there was a derogatory type letter that criticized my dad, uh, written by the, the Catholic priest that brought us back to Seattle, saying that he's kind of taking his time while finding a job and whatever. And it kind of frustrated the WRA because they couldn't say, hey, he's working right now, you know, right away, quick. So why would the, <clears throat> the priest write the letter to the, the WRA authorities. And it was a letter written, so it was part of the record of his, of his history. Now, before your dad went, he, before he left, he was, uh, he'd been working the cannery. Mm -hmm. So when he came back. Yeah, he had to look for a completely new job. And he ended up being a furrier, cleaning fur coats at a shop near uh, where Nordstrom used to be. So he basically had to start over, yeah. start his life yeah. over again. Wow. Did, 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 um. We left our house completely furnished to a family that, that uh, was recommended to us. And it was $19 a month, I think, five bedroom house. When we came back, nothing was left for the house except for one light bulb and one hot, hot plate. The hot water heater in the kitchen stove was gone too. That's why the dish that we had there, the, the priest went over to Fort Lawton and got us a whole set of dishes for us. So my sisters and my younger brothers, I think, stayed at the Marino Convent for X number of days. And we slept on the floor at the house with my dad and my older brother. This empty house. <clears throat> mm -hmm. We came back around 9 o'clock at night, I remember, and uh, we were greeted by the Filipino family, one of our neighbors. Um, but not so enthusiastically, the neighbor right across the street from us, who was a sergeant in the army at Fort Lewis. He was very belligerent about us. But the rest of the neighborhood was treated us okay, except our next door neighbor who lost, who was Japanese uh, owners at the time, lost their house because the renters weren't paying rent on there. Think so they they lost their house and didn't, they never did come back to Seattle. They relocated to Cleveland. But I remember that house was a mess. It was really filthy. So the sergeant across the street that I remember him because he got in a fight with my my brother that was in the army that went to Detroit. He was um, drafted into the army and came. It was a Staff sergeant, I think, at that time. And, and the Filipino guy was a staff sergeant also, and they got into a big brawl. Because he was making some derogatory remarks about, about him or my brother or, or the family. And I remember a chief petty officer who was a Filipino coming to intervene and uh, stop the, fight, the, the fighting. So that was probably a month or so after we came back. The sergeant was Caucasian? No, it was Filipino. Filipino. Yeah. So that um, the house your father didn't lose, though, is that right? <clears throat> That's right, yeah. But everything, it was gut. I mean. Yeah, it, it was completely furnished. When we, le when we left, came back, there was nothing left except the one light bulb and the hot plate. And, and how did you find the family that was supposed to take care of it? Well, um, I think, I think the Marino fathers knew who they were, or we knew the, the family name in a way. And uh, in fact, they, they moved to a house about a block away from us. And we were able to get a lot of the stuff back, but not all of it. Like the china, the, the silverware and things, they were all gone. So when you came home, in a car or a truck together and the family pulls up, was it that type of scene? Or, I mean, do you remember? And so you're yeah, I, don't, I don't remember how we got from the train station. Well, I remember the train stopping in Portland. My brother and I 
took a walk out of the station. And the first thing we see was no Japs, <laughs> no. big signs. In Portland. Yeah, and it scared the living daylights on me. So we, we hustled on back to the station. After the war? This was, no, during, this was during the war, because yeah. we were the, back in 45, I think it was when we came back, just before the war ended. So I think we came back in March or April of 45. Do you remember your mother and father's attitude or feeling? Um, my dad was just a beaten man. He he never did discipline us like he used to. You know, and things. Um, that effect that that really got to me. It, I was, you know, later on I kept thinking. How did this happen? You know, why was he such a beaten, so so disheartened? That was along with the, the house being ransacked. Like it kind of really shook them up, and it shook my mother's religion. You know, belief in God and goodness, kind of took made it a test for her. She became a stronger Catholic as a result of that, but. They took it in stride pretty well. But you, even from your perspective as a child, and again looking back, saw the difference from your father prior to. Oh yes, time. yes, I remember. Yeah. So they, they, it took his spirit away. Yeah. How does it affect the rest of the siblings? Were you just well, kids? I, and <clears throat> my sister, my younger sister. I was the fourth, or the 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 fourth living sibling. My sister was the fifth <clears throat> for me. <clears throat> and she remembers parts of the camp life and things, but my other, other brothers below them don't remember. They were too young, especially. They're almost like Hesus age, I guess. So. But I do remember the first days being very dusty, very dusty having to try to sweep the house without, without the proper tools. And then uh, until they finally got sidewalks in, we were walking in mud a lot of times. And, and uh, um, eventually during our stay there, they had victory gardens in the, in the front of the houses and things. And they had irrigation ditches to water the, help water the plants and things. So pretty well coordinated. Uh, they did the best they could. Like I told Adolf, there, we went back there last year to see what it was like, and it was just all green. Farmlands and oh, just lush with vegetation. It wasn't like that when we were there, <laughs> when we first moved in. Is there any, um, I mean, is it just gone, or is there still there's some? A, there's a structure of the, of the guard gate there. Then we didn't go down far enough to, to see where the um, foundations of the water tower used to be. Um, I remember seeing a, a barrack right across the street that the farm, one of the farmers were using as storage or whatever. That kind of, it seemed smaller than I remember though. It, did, did, it, um, did it bring back any emotion in you or? Yes, yes, it did, yeah. What was that like? Um, thinking back out, you know, what is it, 60 years, is it? 40, 50, 60 years? <clears throat> I was saying, gee, if it wasn't for the war and the Japanese farmers, there, that, that line would never have been irrigated and, and cultivated as it is today if it hadn't been for them you know, during the war time. And that, right now it's become a national monument, but th th there's no real big signs pointing to it. Um, we were fortunate to stay at a motel that had a map of the, the area, and, and they gave us directions to finding the Camp Minidoka. Minidoka. Um, 
I think eventually they're going to start building up that place, but I don't think it's going to be as extensive as Manzanar's exhibit will be. There are some plaques describing, you know, like the layout of the barracks, the camps, and uh, the dedications of the uh, of the populace within the Idaho area, that that kind of kept up the memorial there. Is it a piece of history that's going to be forgotten, or is there enough there that? Eventually, I think if they build up like they think they want to, the national parks, it, it'll be there for permanently as a reminder. I had <coughs> talked to somebody over a year ago, and they had gone back to whichever camp they were at, and there's nothing left in the fact of asking around town people wouldn't tell them and got irritated with them that they were asking about it. Was that right? Yeah. yeah. <clears throat> and I was relaying this story. There was a teacher that was there, and, and I said, you know, to me, the fact that it was lot, being left out of history is no different than the Germans saying the concentration camps never happened. Mm -hmm. she, she, this teacher got all mad at me and said, it's, it's different than that. Yeah. Nobody was killed. But I remember going to school one day in, not in, in California and mentioning the, the internment. And there was a kid back from back east somewhere. He had never heard of it, never heard of the internment. And he was very surprised. There, there's a lot of people that still don't realize that it had happened before. I grew up here and went to a private prep school and never heard of it. Mm. I mean, I'm supposedly yeah. an educated person, you know, and yeah. it was not a part of uh, history that was taught. It, it, for a long time, I think it was. Push out. aside. And then, and then the older generation, my dad's generation, didn't really talk about it until the third or fourth generations came up and said, why didn't you act? Why did you let that happen? And then they started talking about it. So it's not too long ago that it was still kept a secret or not talked about. You have children. Mm -hmm. Did they learn about it in school? Yes, because my daughter wrote a couple essays about her mother's um, life and then my recollections of Puyallup and Idaho. So she was actually helping. Yeah, well, that was part of their class project too. So, have, did, did, have they ever asked you? I mean, did they did they growing up ask you and want to know about it? Or um, my daughter, I, th I think that they did. Um, they would ask my my wife more than me, because I usually was kind of kept it to myself. Then. <clears throat> When you look back in retrospect to what happened, does it create emotions in, in your mind, or, or is it? The 9-11 date really brought back the fears that, that it could happen again because of how they were treating the, the, the Muslim community. And uh, it could have happened, I guess, if it was such a, for a bigger movement around. There's nothing that's stopping them from doing it again, I guess. There's no constitutional law or whatever that prevents it again. That's the so scary part. That, that was scary to me, yes. Because it, it did bring back those memories of back to, during World War II. I, um, somebody was saying that it was interesting because when they were there and they were a young child, it didn't affect them as much. And then they discovered that later in their life, uh, post-traumatic is the word they use mm. nowadays, but affected them because it created a fear that was in the back of their mind that they didn't realize. Mm -hmm. Some of dealing with prejudice and things of that. Yeah. 
Is there a message that needs to be left for the for the future generations to no. be aware? Don't let it happen again. Um, we are all citizens, and we should be treated like citizens, and not randomly picked because of our color, because of our religion, because because of our stature. Whatever. Is it, that made me think. It was interesting because you described Minidoka as it developed. And you talked about victory gardens mm -hmm. being planted. And again, to think of here is a country that for the people that were citizens said, you're no longer citizens. Some that before they'd be saying, you can't be citizens. And we're going to put you away because we're afraid of you. But yet, when they came and asked for people to volunteer, defend our country, the volunteers, the victory gardens, um, and, and not, a, not a protest against the country at that time. Well, there were, there were some that said, you know, the, the so-called no-no boys refused because of their principles, and, and I don't blame them, that they said our civil rights were being violated, and until you correct it, that they shouldn't be forced to in the service. They were ostracized by the rest of the Japanese community for that for a long, long time. It was just recently that the JACL did apologize for their behavior, for their, the JACL's position up to that time of ostracizing those people that said no, no. And no, no was the, you know, the two questioners, uh, will you pledge allegiance to the United States or whatever. And the okay. second was, to, um, to what, denounce Japan? Dis yeah, ju yeah, yeah, things like that. So you wouldn't take arms against My them. father had trouble with that question, too. I remember that. Did, did he? He raised, he, he raised some questions about it and um, kind of prolonged the interview. But I don't, I don't remember exactly what he said, what he what he felt at that time. But. You know, it's interesting, again, because you were going to mess halls to eat and, and things of that sort. There wasn't a time where a family sat down around a table. And well, eventually, at, towards the end, each of the families were able to bring home food from the mess halls and serve food at home. But we didn't, we didn't have refrigeration. You know, they, they cut holes in the floor and like a, like a cooler with a lid on it. They kept food that way, but there was no refrigeration at all. Um, so it was kind of limited on what you could. I, th I don't remember how they got the dishes, though, either. Do you remember any holidays, birthdays or Christmas or anything like that? Anything Christmas like that? time was very fun in camp. Um, each of the blocks had a contest on who could decorate the mess halls the, the prettiest and the best. And some of the stuff that came out of that thing was just unbelievable. And we used to walk through all the, the blocks just to watch the displays. So I assume they had to get pretty creative because it wasn't Oh, like yeah. A lot of crepe paper. <laughs> yeah. Did they do? They this? had dances for the, for the high school kids and in the mess halls. We had a softball field right in the lot next to us, and a big gravel pit that they dumped all the gravel on, and we used to look for agates there. Um, we used to play football on the, the, in the same open field, and it was all lava rocks. Ooh. <laughs> we learned how to tackle, though. <laughs> <coughs> wow. And then there was a rec hall. Um, an R block that had to house the movies for the people. I remember going to those a lot. Did you have to pay, or was it? I don't remember. We must have had to pay, but I don't remember. There was a canteen right across the street from us that that sold, you know, candies and things. And I don't know how the kids got their clothes you know, as they were growing up. 
there was no army clothes that would fit them. So I don't know how they got their clothes. I, could, I think each family was given X number of dollars to provide for clothing through the catalogs and things. So yeah, that's how they did it. Yeah. Yeah. Because I did not, looking at some of the pictures, I did notice that yeah, as people yeah, grew up, they. Yeah, four years, you, you'd probably <laughs> outgrow the pants, I think so. But the older people were given army, army clothing. I remember some of them having the, the old style hat, hats and things. So they, they made out as best they could with them. So they had always oh, like army surplus clothing, mm -hmm. basically. It's funny because that's the stuff you don't think about. Uh, how yeah. did they get clothing yeah. out? Yeah, how do they get clothing? How did, how did I get my lunches at school when we had to walk a mile to go to school? Did we come back to the barracks to eat lunch at, at our barracks? Or did we get, pack lunches? And I don't, I don't remember now. Do you remember any of your teachers? Yes. Uh, can't, um, can't think of the names right now, but I remember. They were mostly Quakers, is it? Oh, is that right? Yeah. Doing them good to eat. Yeah. Like that kind of thing. Yeah. Huh. The, um, So you must have been some of the first families out of camp then, if you... Yeah, we were, we were the third family back to Seattle area. And <coughs> now I understand what you're... So, so going back, they wanted to use your dad as a poster child, basically, mm -hmm. to say, look... Propaganda at to say, hey, there's plenty of available jobs and good jobs. What's At least that's what I got from the letter that was written by this priest to the authorities back there at that time, when, when my dad was still hee-hawing about which jobs to take and whatever. Wow. Yeah. It's interesting because my understanding is Bainbridge uh, was also supposed to be a poster child. They, the government filmed it and documented it very well to show other Japanese families and say, oh, look at how well-behaved everybody was on Bainbridge, and so you know, mm -hmm. go about doing what we want you to do. I think the culture here was different, too. They were more closely related to their community, whereas in Seattle, it was too vast. Um, there was a Japanese community, but then it was also splintered. Um, not everybody lived in the same you know, section of town. Remember my Chinese friend still mentions every once in a while that he still has that badge that said I'm Chinese. They they had to wear because they had curfew. After six, I think was for us. Which is again so funny because I mean it's you know that broad brush stroke. Oh, anybody that's that's even Asian looking, you know, yeah. oh well, they're all the yeah. same. Well, yeah. no, well, that's not yeah. true. So they have this button that says, but if you got a button that said I'm Chinese, you probably could have worn it around and. Yeah. Gone wherever. We interviewed one person that their teacher said, when the kids came in with those, she said, take them all off. Mm. Because my kids are all my children. This is one, one of the schools, and I will not tolerate this, mm -hmm. this type of discrimination. It always stuck to me. I remember going, before we were interned, going to the baseball game at Seattle Rainiers, the sixth, sixth stadium, walking there and, and throwing pots for the scrap iron, you know, Beat the Japs, uh, think, thinking nothing of it <laughs> at that time. Yeah, it's that perception, you know, that you get older. And I just, the, the thing from, that you tell that really sticks out in my mind is that vision of imagine your parents coming home with the family to the house and having everything they worked yeah. so hard for you. They trusted somebody. They were very popular with the neighbors afterwards because we had all these rations for sugar and all these <laughs> milk, butter. We used to give them to the neighbors because we didn't use that much sugar and flour and things. So they kind of made the neighbors happy. <laughs> <laughs> did did, uh, did you get old enough to, to be able to, I might ask you this already, I can't remember, but old enough to have a conversation with your dad in later years about looking back? He, he, he never did really talk about never camp, did. No, how he felt and how it affected him. 
about Cause, mainly because I, I don't think we really asked. Yeah. And my mother, during her later years, probably came out and said things. But she was one of the interviewees at the uh, restitution hearings. <clears throat> and she described the, the pregnancy at camp. And uh, so she came out and was more verbal afterwards. <clears throat> but until that time, she, they, they kept to themselves. I guess the way I felt was, well, it's a fact of life. I mean, you know, we went through it. But I'm not going to make a big deal out of it. What did you think about the um, apology letter restitution? Started by Reagan and signed by Bush. Well, it was it was a start. Um, most people, I think, feel that the monetary portion of it was insufficient, but it was a start as far as having the government apologize for an, an act that was really, really not American at all. Do you think that they might have been better had they even not have brought a money aspect into it, but kept it on us? Um, I think the money portion had to come in as part of this society that says, I'm going to sue you, uh, no matter how much. It's just a matter of suing the, the wrong, or, or justifying, or not justifying, but correcting the wrong that was done to them physically or mentally. So I think there was some value in the monetary reconciliation, but uh, restitution, I mean. But uh, I think that's part of American society is to, is to sue. It's one of those ones when you think about apologizing and making good for it. How do, you know, it's a tough one. Yeah. <clears throat> I would compare it to what happened and continues to happen. Um, how do we bring it back into balance? You know, how, how do we do it? I guess some of it is, is in, at least in my view, it's the moving forward of working to prevent. We're never going to undo it, but mm -hmm. hopefully the other uh, extreme. Yeah. I think all my life I've always felt that I was different as far as being an American because of my color, because of my race. And it affected me in my work, in my school. Um, I felt inferior at times, I think. That, that's just the way the society made me feel, I think. Which is interesting because as I've done this project more and I've looked at this in other ways and never thought about it in this way. In fact, when I was talking to Frank, I talked about this. I said, you know, it's interesting. My perception that was given to me of the Japanese of that generation was not of, you know, for, through history books and whether it was planned or not planned, I don't know how it came there, but not of business people but owning businesses and, and, and American citizens and all that. There was this different view, mm -hmm. you know. And to go back now and look at pictures and say, they're family, they're businessmen and mothers and children and all that. And, 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 and But there is, there is or was uh, a vision created, I think, in, in our historical portrayal, whether it came from the World War II propaganda or whatever, and then went on and on to bronze and, you know. So hopefully our society with media and information exposes more. There will always be there people there that I would say it really never happened yet. It's just a figment of their imagination. I think there's going to be, still be that, that doubt, no matter how accurate the, the documentation becomes. <clears throat> there's going to be people who still want to push it aside, because it's not American. And that might be part of the key right there, because it's not American. Well, they're perceived American. Yeah. Yeah. We, we, it, America wouldn't do that. Yeah.